the hope for every poet is that every new book is an extension of the imaginative landscape of the of the work up till then and uh, I certainly feel that with horse music I'm extending uh, trying to go further out into where I went in black moon and uh, and, and and maybe maybe try to bring in something that I've always uh, liked about poetry when I started an element of the otherworldly and uh, ghosts and, 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 and sort of stuff like that and and and, uh, and I'm very fond of the great late paintings of Jack Yeats that hang in the National Gallery in Dublin and every time I go to Dublin I go in there and I love these uh, these magic ghost horses in his paintings and uh, and as I was working on this book uh, I began to feel that one of the strands that I wanted running through the book was 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 magic horses and uh, another thing there are a number of Berlin poems in the book I I remember coming to spend the year in Berlin that I was uh, in one of the guest artists for the DAD Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst and uh, I was picked up in the airport coming from Romania and the driver said the DAD would like uh, its invited writers to write about Berlin but we know that it can take a bit of time to assimilate a city before it starts emerging in the poetry. So the likelihood is that it's when you leave Berlin that these poems about Berlin will start to happen. And that's nearly what happened. I wrote, uh, I was writing them after I'd been stayed on in Berlin for about three or four years after that initial year. Horse music. Hearing of horses speaking Irish on the island, he took a boat out there, paid an islander daft money to lead him to the westernmost field, where a shy pair of russet ponies stood head to head on a hilly mound that jutted out over the leaping froth of the Atlantic. He pretended not to notice them, said goodbye to his guide, an Irish picked up from books in southern Spain, his lifetime's hobby, then sat on his hunkers, listening hard. But either the horses were quiet, or he needed to get closer. He waited until a gang of squeaking gulls got the horses neighing. Then over he went, soothing them with murmurs, stroking them, until one said in fluent Irish to the other, This hairy fellow could be okay, but we can't trust him, can't trust any of them. Two legs, I mean, imagine yourself like that. The other whinnied and hoofed the ground then began to sing a song, a wrenching lament for a red-haired woman that intensified when the second horse joined in, so the man slipped away, head down, back to the harbour. This poem is a homage to the great German writer Heinrich von Kleist, who is buried on the banks of the big lake, the Vansi. Fans. Seven horses climbed out of the Vansi and galloped dripping to Kleist's grave. They neighed and bent their forelegs. One wrapped the stone gently with a hoof. Another came forward to lick the name. Then one by one they felt a weight drop on their backs and a jab in the side poked them into a joyful canter along the big lake's bank. Such whinnying had not been heard for centuries, thought a man walking three barking terriers. When each horse returned, another left, till all seven had felt the rider's weight. Then they stood in a ring around the grave to neigh a soft, high-pitched chorus before pulling off in strict formation to trot in a row heads high, back to where they'd left the water, wade in again, watched by a group of shrieking kids, then swim in an arc towards the farther shore. The 
the tunnel. Into the tunnel he went, led by a torch, a tiny silver torch bought in Crete. In his pocket was a scalpel and a folded bag. His mobile was slotted into his belt. Earphones brought him Coltrane's gnarled tones. He wriggled past a dog's skull, a tennis ball, a dusty copy of the Bible. An edition of North was propped against the wall. He checked. It was signed. He slithered on, his beam now bouncing off mosaic mirrors on the low ceiling. As the sack swirled, he hummed along, sniffing the trapped air, feeling ahead, as if the light would miss something vital, would blank out a sign. He stuck gum in his mouth. Chewing, he muscled on, past a framed photo of bombed Berlin, a warped tennis racket, a gun. A map of Europe appeared on the wall, then disappeared. A voice rode over Coltrane, counting to a hundred, and at the hundred he emerged into a red chamber. He stood up and walked to the seated corpse. This poem begins and ends in Berlin, and in between goes to the Donegal of my childhood. Sunday morning. The Sunday morning bells are clanging and clanking, droning and echoing. And somewhere a dog, a black cocker spaniel, is howling. And my rotund grandmother wants me to go to the shop before the crowd leaves mass, to buy her woodbines and silver mints and get myself a Peggy's leg. So as soon as the bells die away, Bonzo and I head up the road where his enemy, the goose, is waiting to charge out, lunging at him, while I kick at the jabbing neb and shout, calling the dog after me, as the farmer stands on his door and laughs, till we cross to the other side, where the shop should be, but isn't, and the dog has vanished, and the cash in my hand is a different currency, and hundreds of houses, streets, squares are all around me, so I run back down, but the sea is gone, then the bells start up again. I lived in Romania for a number of years and uh, I heard it said when I was there that uh, Romania was the home of surrealism. And indeed, uh, things happened there that seemed close to that. The Slow Story of No. There's a reference here to Tweeka. Tweeka is like a, a homemade plum brandy kind of, kind of thing that, 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 that people make in, in Romania. The Slow Story of No. Sing us a gypsy song. Set the accordion going. Get the Tweeka flowing. Invite us to sing along, making it up as we go, but following you as you tell. In a Carpathian howl, the slow story of no. No more cities on the grass, next to the bottle bank. No mustachioed men to thank for clearing the rusty mess. No, it happened organically, like a mouse corpse rotting. No heads were plotting, the wheels rolled away. The doors and windows walked, the leather seats flew over the morning dew. No bystander gawked. The engine gave a creak and wrenched itself up to float like a spaceship into another week. And the chassis that remained let wind blow through it, let children climb on it while old men complained. And no thin grey horse chomped grass until his trailer was full with nothing of course. And no Mercedes on the grass, the slow story of no. This is a poem that um, reminds me of the great uh, Elizabeth Bishop line, The Little That We Get For Free. Booty. Going down the hill in a striped French t-shirt, I met a thrush who was bashing a snail on the road repeatedly while cars whizzed past. Then as the road levelled and the river arrived, I spied a heron perched on a half-submerged supermarket trolley just before the sawn-off stump 
of the vandalised tree, newly peeled and sporting a sad face in sketched black lines. So I slunk on to the market where I half lived and I asked my butcher for a cheap French cut.